Second, if there was no reason to believe an O-ring failure would be catastrophic, as Astro Brandt alleges, how does he explain this memo that Beaujolais sent off to his superiors in July 1985 and read out before the Rogers Commission? I have here a letter which appears to be one signed by you dated July 31st, 1985, and I'll ask Dr. Keel uh, to give it to you. Uh, and I gather from the f files that we received from you, you wrote a series of letters or memos to, I guess memos is a better way to describe it. Those were activity reports. Yes. Uh, expressing your concern about this problem of the seals and the o-rings and so forth. I would ask you, if you don't mind, to read that memorandum dated July 31st, which you wrote to Dr. to R.K. Lund, who is Vice President of Engineering. Yes. Would you mind? <coughs> yes. This letter is written to ensure that management is fully aware of the seriousness of the current o-ring erosion problem in the SRM joints from an engineering standpoint. The mistakenly accepted position on the joint problem was to fly without fear of failure and to run a series of design evaluations which would ultimately lead to a solution or at least a significant reduction of the erosion problem. This position is now drastically changed as a result of the SRM 16A nozzle joint erosion which eroded a secondary O-ring with the primary O-ring never sealing. If the same scenario should occur in a field joint, parentheses, and it could, then, close parentheses, then it is a jump ball as to the success or failure of the joint because the secondary O-ring cannot respond to the clevis opening rate and may not be capable of pressurization. The result would be a catastrophe of the highest order, dash, loss of human life. An unofficial team, parentheses, a memo defining the team and its purpose was never published, close parentheses, with leader was formed on 19 July 1985 and was tasked with solving the problem for both the short and the long term. This unofficial team is essentially non-existent at this time. In my opinion, the team must be officially given the responsibility and the authority to execute the work that needs to be done on a non-interference basis, parenthesis, full-time assignment until completed, close parenthesis. It is my honest and very real fear that if we do not take immediate action to dedicate a team to solve the problem, with the field joint having the number one priority, then we stand in jeopardy of losing a flight along with all the launch pad facilities. Then I signed it, and a manager that I work for countersigned it, as concurred. Thank you. I assume, Mr. Thompson, you agree with the contents of that memorandum. Absolutely. Yes, sir. When I pointed this out, Astro Brandt wrote, Look, you're full of crap and offensive as hell. You're a mega conceited, arrogant punk. And when you accuse NASA of murdering an entire shuttle crew just to inflate your goddamn ego, it really starts to get me pissed off! The commander has the final call. You just chose to ignore that. He was on the shuttle. He knew the risks. The only thing stupider and more offensive than the people who started this claim are the people who perpetuate it like the brain-dead conspiracy parrots you are. Two words, Astro Brandt. Decaf. And it is not true that the command pilot Dick Scobie was given the final call to launch or not. The man who had the final decision whether or not to launch was Jesse Moore, Associate Administrator for Spaceflight. Moore claims he did not know of any no-go recommendations. Stanley Ramatas, the manager at Marshall's Shuttle Project Office, who attended the teleconference by the way, claims he did not inform Moore of Thiokol's warnings. And that elements of the US government assisted in the 9-11 terrorist attacks. 
A Venezuelan diplomat is claiming that his country has locked in enough votes to win a non-permanent seat at the United Nations Security Council. The claim has came as Venezuela's President Hugo Chavez again lashed out at the United States. He told supporters in Caracas it was plausible that the US government was involved in the September 11th attacks to justify its subsequent offensives in Afghanistan and Iraq. Ten questions were unanswered due to objections and diversions. This was predictable. Three more dodged questions seemed to lean toward yes. Oh, please. Those so-called unanswered questions were deliberate misrepresentations of Renee's alternative science theories. Obviously, I'm not going to answer yes or no to whether or not I believe straw man versions of Renee's theories but rather set the record straight and perhaps explain whether or not I feel it holds water. Astro Brandt asked me, do you believe electromagnetism, not gravity, governs the motion of the planets? Rene was a proponent of the Electric Universe model. Electric Universe proponents don't deny the existence of gravity, they believe both forces, gravity and electromagnetism, are at play in governing the universe. As I stated, I have not had the time to review all the pros and cons of this theory, but at least I am open to hear it out. Which is more than what I can say about the administrators of the bad astronomy forums who promptly lock any thread that dares support or even discuss the Electric Universe model. Astro Brandt also asked me, do you believe dinosaurs coexisted with humans? Astro Brandt has often attributed this claim to Ralph Rene, even though nowhere has he ever made such an absurd claim. This accusation stems not from one of Rene's books or any of his online essays or whatever, but from an anti-Rene site by Tom Napier of Fact.com which seems to be the primary source material for all of Astro Brandt's hate campaign against Rene. Napier alleges that Rene believed the equatorial bulge is impossible. False. Rene clearly wrote in his last Skeptic of Science book, I know that an equatorial bulge must exist. My only argument is its magnitude. Another straw man version of Rene's position. Napier also alleges that Rene said, Ice Ages couldn't happen. And yet, in his skeptic book, Rene wrote, We are now living in the Antarctic Ice Age. I think you get the idea. I won't go through all of Napier's logical fallacies, but instead just cut to the point. Napier claims that Rene believed dinosaurs coexisted with humans and that dragons were real. To explore this, I contacted Dr. Stephen Rourke whom Rene would have check over his writings and is now in charge of book sales. He sent me all, and I mean all, of Rene's writings. I read every last word of these papers, and I can emphatically say the claim about Rene believing dinosaurs coexisting with humans and that dragons were real is a steaming pile of bullshit. The only thing even remotely close to Napier's claims is an old essay by Rene titled On Dragons. It doesn't say anything about dragons being real, but rather only uses the word as a metaphor for the tyrants in power in government and intelligence agencies. A metaphor is not supposed to be taken literally. We contacted Fact.com and Napier, requesting him to send any writings by Rene in which he claims dinosaurs coexisted with humans, and they have refused to do so. There was one partial no and one no with an excuse for casing. Jera says it was just a casual exaggeration of how many stars could be seen from the moon. So he does disagree with the figure of trillions of stars but Casing's little exaggeration was 100 million to a billion times too large. Well, if you want to get technical, the number of stars that can be seen from Earth on a clear night is close to 6,000. And this number goes way higher outside the atmosphere. But seeing the star counts were immaterial to the point that Casing was making. He merely substituted an expression that any rational person would understand to mean a huge number of stars. 
In forums, Astro Grant pathologically and psychotically insisted that Casing's statement was not an exaggeration. Casing is hardly alone in making casual exaggerations. I have seen many people make them in movies, documentaries and so forth. In any case, it's immaterial. Astro Grant claims the lunar surface was way too bright for the astronauts to see stars from. Yet we have eyewitness testimonies from individuals who made Earth orbit, or at least claim to have made Earth orbit, and say they saw stars whilst on the daylight side of Earth. Keep in mind, the daylight side of the Earth is considerably brighter than the lunar surface. If you can see stars on the daylight side of Earth, seeing stars on the daylight side of the Moon should be child's play.